Evidently, Nick was having a little problems with sound level when he was making the video. I think he so was he, falling asleep. Was he just? <laughs> yeah, and okay, he fell okay. asleep. Oh, okay, I'm back. I'm back. All right. He All right, we're glad weekend. you're here today. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone that's here. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. This is Pastor Suzanne. If you're our guest here, we welcome you. Uh, we've had a lot going on in the church here lately. A lot of things are are happening. We had. Uh, this week we had a flood. We had a flood this week. We're waiting for the plague of locusts next. They're right? not. They're yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. Coming. yeah. So, but we wait. do want to thank everybody that uh, came to the rescue and kind of came in and we got some dryers on the carpet and got everything fixed and people came in and put new baseboards down for yeah. us and still have a couple of our staff. We had hoped that they would do their offices first, but we were with the youth and they did our office first, so we were able to get cleaned up a little bit. But hopefully our staff will get the rest cleaned up. So, yeah. uh, just a big thank you to everybody for helping us in the midst of that. Yeah. Thank you for everyone. One, most definitely. You know, We're, like you're in your house and you walk into a room and the carpet's flooded with water. Not a good a feeling, squishy. right? So, it was yeah, a little squishy, so. but it's nothing compared to what's happening over in Louisiana and down that's south right. right now. That's it's, right. It's, that's so true. We're, we're blessed in, uh, considering that. We're glad you're here for this message series, Thrive. Um, the, if you notice, we used a tree for the image for this, for the central image, because trees are signs of life. They're signs of prosperity. They're signs of uh, productivity, of hope, of peace. Trees have been used throughout the centuries for a lot of things, and, and we wanted to use it for this series. Now, a lot of you are like, well, you know, I'd love to thrive, but my life doesn't feel very productive. It doesn't feel like I'm thriving. It doesn't feel like I'm, sometimes it just feels like I'm just making it, right? And like Suzanne said, you know, we, we tend to live off of four little words in our culture specifically, and those words are, if I could just. If I could just, you know, get that job. If I could just get that promotion, if I could just pay off this debt, I would be, everything would be all right, right? That's the unspoken part of it. If I could just get these kids out of the house, right? You know, amen, right? Some of you have already sent them off, so it's great. But, you know, hey, if I could just, if I could just make it to this weekend, if I could just make this relationship work, right? We have millions of these. If we could just do it, and you know what happens? Those things happen, we change our behaviors, and we try everything to make that work, and we try to make it work, and what happens is we live in this continual, kind of perpetual sense of disappointment because we get there, and that thing happened, and nothing changed, right? We live, we live with the perpetual disappointment if I could just, right? And there's one thing that's the same when you got there, if you could just to that moment, and it's us, right? We're the same being. We're the same person. It didn't matter if the situation changed around us. We're the same in it. And so when nothing changes, we're disappointed. But we, we need to start looking at ourselves because we need to be transformed. We have to. That's what this church is going to be about. It's about transforming lives, about changing. And it's not just about changing your behavior so you can hit that little goal that you think is going to change your life. It's not about behavior modification. It's about being modification. That's what God is about, is about changing your inner being. So no matter what your circumstances are, any, it doesn't matter what's just going to happen that will change everything. You're going to be whole. You're going to be sane. You're going to be at peace in the middle of it. And that takes transformation on our part. Paul said it this way. He said, don't live the way the world lives. Let your way of thinking be completely changed. Then you'll be able to test what God wants for you. And you will agree that what he wants is right. His plan is good and pleasing and perfect. See, we don't, we, we don't want to go through life just hanging on by our fingernails and just surviving. We were built to thrive. But if you want to thrive, we have to be transformed. We spent some time as, you know, we've, we've just been appointed over here full time and yeah. then we're still counting the numbers. I don't know how long we'll know, but today is the seventh week that we've been able to be here with you and we just love being with you. Can we just say that? Yeah. We're just like a big giant group hug. I mean, it's so wonderful to be here, so wonderful to see uh, what God is doing and how the transformation is working us. But we had to spend some time thinking about what does it mean to make a disciple? Uh, we were at a church conference yesterday, uh, a new church for the bunch of church planners, and in it, one of the big, the big conversations that you see when church leaders get together is, how do you make a disciple? And that's a fancy word for follower. How do you make a follower of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live? I mean, there are so many distractions. Would you not agree with that? I mean, there are, there are just, I mean, it is hard just to even find a moment of quiet. And in fact, it's so rare for us to have a moment of quiet that when we get a moment of quiet, we don't even know what to do with it, right? I mean, we want to feel it. We want to grab our phone. We want to do something. I mean, I worry about traffic accidents now because no one, when they're parked at a red light, is looking at the 
of traffic around them. So, so there's no eyewitnesses anymore because when the minute we, our car stops, what do you see everybody doing at the traffic light? They're all on their phones at the truck. I mean, you know, no one. We're, we're at the doctor's office. We can't even see somebody who may be crying sitting next to the doctor's office because what are we doing? We've got our head buried down. And that, you know, there's so many distractions. So in the midst of all that and all these things pulling at people and the, the things in our economy, the problems in the world, the vi- my goodness, how do we make a follower of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live? And so everybody, every church body, has to figure out how they're going to do it in their particular context. So we've spent some time with our vision time and with some of our leadership. We've talked about a a, a simple strategy, and ours kind of goes like this. We have no grow and go. Overarching thing is pass it on. And so no, we spoke about no last week as part of our Thrive series. You see, you've got to know, in order for you to thrive in your life, you've got to know, are you ready for this, that God loves you. That God thinks you're wonderful. That if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on the refrigerator. We talked about God's crazy love for you. You live in a world that somehow told you less than, but God is more than enough. God is more than enough for you to achieve anything you want to do, for you to be able to thrive in the world around you. So we talked about what it means to know God last Sunday. If you weren't here, you can get online and listen to that so you can catch up, kind of go back and do the reruns. Heritage reruns, right? And, and then this morning, we're going to talk about this concept. We're going to talk about growing a little. What does it mean to grow? You see, followers of Christ grow. We grow in all kinds of different ways. We're going to talk about that. And then God told us to go. I mean, over and over again in Scripture, you see, Jesus told us to what? Go. Did Jesus say, sit right here, put your feet up and do whatever you want, and then get out of here and hurt, rush off to Red Robin after church? No, he said to go. So we have to take, we have to take those words to heart. And so we know, we grow, and we go, and in the process, we're able to pass it on. You're like, well, what is it? Well, it is the power of God's love. We're able to pass on the power that Jesus Christ has when he comes into our lives. We're able to pass on his love, his mercy, his compassion, his patience, his peace. Do you think the world is hungry for that in the world in which we live? I think so. I think we have the, the, the transformative message to answer so many of the things that we experience in the world around us. It's just the power of Christ. So today we're going to talk about this concept of growing. Now, a lot of times when we talk about growing, we think about growing just as individuals. I want you to hear this this morning. As we start off this, we're going to talk about grow. Is, are you ready for this? God does not want you to stay the same way all the time. He doesn't. So if you're sitting here and you're living your faith out the same way you were six months ago, maybe you're not growing. And, and, you know, only you can judge that. Have you grown in your faith from last, you know, from last year to this year? How are you doing on that? And then we have to look at how we grow as individuals, and we're going to discuss that this morning. But we also have to look at how we grow as a church. Now, a lot of people, when a church starts to talk about growing, they start getting uncomfortable. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, because yeah, you know what people will say? They'll say, I like the church this size. I, 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 like, I, I like it just the way. I, I don't want us to grow. Well, i got to tell you, that would, that's against the will of God, right? Isn't it the will of God that the church would grow? And people will say things like, all oh, you pastors, all y'all care about are numbers. You know what? Numbers are important. But you know why numbers are important? Because numbers represent what? People. People. You know, there are people in here that might have, anybody in here have four kids? Anybody have four kids? Yeah, okay, some of you have four kids. Okay, so when somebody says to you, how many kids do you have? Do you say, ah, uh, one, one to two? No, you know exactly how many kids you have, you right? You say, I've got four kids, four, count them, because every single one of them counts. And every person outside the doors, every person you meet anywhere you go, every single one of them count. And for order for us to reach them for Jesus Christ, We're going to have to spend some time thinking about how are we growing individually because the church won't grow if you don't grow. It takes all of us working together. Now, this concept of growing, it's a biblical concept. I mean, if you look up in Scripture, you know know how you can get on a a Google search and you can search the word grow in Scripture over a thousand times. Do you think our God's the God of growth? Yes, our God is the God of growth. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself this. Have, are you growing in grace? Are you more graceful than you were last year? Are you a little less judgmental than you were last year? I mean, what a great thing to grow in. You know, if we're going to grow in anything, wouldn't it be great if we could all grow in grace? And then grow in the knowledge, and we talked about that last week. You know, grow in your knowledge of God. There's that head knowledge, but there's also this heart knowledge of knowing how God thinks you're fearfully and wonderfully made and how he loves you. 
But in our lives, all throughout our lives, you know, we're called, there's times for us when we need to grow. I mean, I think about school going back just recently, right? When school went back, what were all the kindergarten moms? Did y'all see the Facebook post with all the kindergarten mommies? What were they doing? <laughs> they all dropped their little baby off, and they're all crying and all that. I mean, because, you know, there's this baby, and then there was a toddler, and then they took them to our awesome preschool and all that, and then they're all grown up, and off they go to kindergarten. Oh, gosh, I have to leave them with these crazy teachers, right? I mean, the moms, you know, they're all, you know, they're all crying, and then... You know, then we have our moms who had to drop their kids off at the middle school. You know. They're not going to make it. They're just not going to you know, make it. Middle school. I mean, you know, middle school. <laughs> hey. You guys mid- remember middle school? Middle school is hard to survive, right? Can, um, how many of you would even say middle school is hard to survive? Y'all remember middle school? Who wants to go back there? No, no. Middle school is I mean. tough. Mid- you know, all the upperclassmen. No, middle, middle school is tough. That's why you should be nice to middle schoolers because it's tough, right? And so, you know, we have middle schoolers growing. And then some of us, we have kids that are starting their senior year. Hmm. And we think, how'd that happen? I mean, how could, how could my child possibly be a senior when I, only, I was only 12 when I had them, right? I mean, how is that possible? <laughs> and, then, and then it goes on. And then some of us, some people you saw, like on Facebook, they had to drop their kid off at college. And boy, that just changes everything. It just changes your whole lookout. But you know, life is Free just a life. series. We just grow all the time. God has us wired where we continually grow. Our, our, just as trees grow and they have seasons, we grow. And just growth is a part of our life. So, so what are some ways that we need to grow in our lives? Well, we need to grow emotionally. Could you imagine if you didn't get something you wanted and you acted the way a two-year-old does if you don't give them the Coke when they want it? I mean, y'all ever seen a kid throw a fit? I mean, I, wait a minute. Have you seen some grown-ups throw a fit? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then you yeah. would think to themselves, they're, they're not emotionally grown, are they? I mean, they're not, they're not very good. There's even there's this phrase. It's called, you know, uh, to grow emotionally is to manage your emotions. I mean, you ever sit in a group of people and you're really like in a really bad mood and you just want to be snarky with people and you're having to rein your emotions in? Anybody ever Sorry. have to do that, you know? Or you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you, yeah. Want to, or you want to tell somebody, you know, you're, you're kind of angry and you want to say something, you kind of have to rein. You know, we spend a lifetime learning to manage our emotions. There's even a thing called EQ. Have you all ever heard of EQ? There's IQ, right? IQ is, you know, you're kind of born with that. And you're just, you know, you might grow a little, learn, get a little bit and you're, that's your uh, intellect quotient. But there's also EQ, which is your emotional quotient. And if you find yourself struggling to grow emotionally, uh, read in a book by Travis Bradbury called EQ is very important because you can never raise your IQ, you know that? When you get the, I mean, your IQ is just kind of there. It's just kind of how you're born. But you can raise your EQ, your ability to manage your emotions and read the emotions of others. And there's this whole book that, that has out. You can read and learn how to do that if you want. So that's the way to grow. Another way we grow is mentally. I mean, just as all the kids are going back to school, we need to always be challenging ourselves mentally. We always need to be learning new things. We need to be students, students of the world and, and, and students of people and students of God. I mean, one thing you know, if you, if you get in, even just a little bit of education, what do you realize? You start to realize that you don't know everything, right? And there's no way you're going to know everything. You can have a conversation with somebody else and they know all about this one thing and you know nothing. The, the, the world is so vast. And so we grow mentally when we become lifelong learners. And we're constantly trying to push ourselves to grow a little bit. They even say to uh, be a lifelong learner is good for your physical health. You know, it helps you with dementia and things like that to continually learn. And then we need to grow relationally. Anybody need to grow in their relationships? Anybody, like, seem to have, like, problems in your relationships, you know? Like, maybe you make a friendship or whatever, and then y'all get in a fight, and then it gets just over and over, and, you know, maybe you've tried these relationships, and the relationships don't work, and, and you always blame the other people. Well, it's their fault, and it's her fault, and it's this, and guess what the common denominator in all your relationships is? You. Yeah, so maybe we need to grow relationally. The Bible kind of puts it this way, that we're to love God, and we're to love others. But this relationship piece is a really, really big piece. Now, I know for me in my life, you know, there was a time when I, when I collected friends the way people used to collect Beanie Babies, right? And I'd be looking, you know, you all know what I'm talking about. I mean, I had, you know, all these Beanie Babies, and I wanted all these friends all the time. And I just wanted to put them all on a shelf. And kind of like on Facebook when it says you have a 1,000 friends. I mean, really? Are you having a 1,000 friends over for dinner Saturday? I mean, come on. a 1,000 friends, right? Well, I've gotten to a point in my life where I'm more about quality than quantity. You know, it's all about the, qual- the quality to me. I'm not really worried so much about the quality. You know, you, know, you, know, you know how to really test how you're doing relationally? This is really, this is the best test ever. Who are the people that you could call at 2 a.m. and they would come to whatever's happening in your life? Who are those people? 
Now, Michael and I, we do a lot of weddings, and in fact, we're working with three couples right now, getting ready for some weddings that are coming up, and we do a lot of premarital, and as, as we do the weddings, we go through this uh, premarital assessment that they take, and one of the areas that it measures is their, um, is their leisure activities, and an area of that is friends. And over and over again, I see a lot of couples who don't have couple friends. You know, over and over again, we need to grow relationally. In fact, we believe it's such a problem that uh, people don't have couple friends that we're actually going to address that as a church later on this fall to give people an opportunity to have those couple friendships because those are so very important if we're going to grow relationally. And then we have, thank you very much, and then we have growing, probably the most important thing for sure is how do we grow spiritually. I mean, look at what it tells us. It tells us we're to grow in grace. What a great thing to grow. We're to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And all through Scripture, over and over again, we're challenged to grow, to grow. How are you doing? How are you growing? You can look at a tree, and you can see how it's doing in its growth. Our growth's kind of hidden, isn't it? But here's the deal. You know. You know. No one in here has to know, but you know. And God speaks to you and lets you know if you need to grow in that. A great question to ask yourself is, you know, how is it with my soul? How am I doing? See, if we want to thrive, we got to be willing to grow. You know, God wants us to have a whole life. I mean, I don't think we get that. We're so focused on how broke up we are and how much we need God and all that. And we do. I mean, we need to be saved. We need, but in order to be transformed, in order to grow. It's not until we submit our, God, our lives to God, this God that we've come to know, that we can start to grow into a whole being built in the image of God. But there are things that, that kind of hold us back. There's things that, that stunt our growth. You know, you can stunt the growth of a tree easily. Put it in the shade, you know. Don't give it any nutrients. Don't give it any water. Put it through drought. Whatever. There's all kinds of ways you can stunt the growth of a tree. And there's all kinds of ways that we stunt our own growth. That we hold ourselves back. And I don't know if it's intentionally, but it happens. I mean, we, we stunt our growth. And this is definitely like a first world problem, right? Imbalance. You ever plant a tree in a pot and you just left it there too long and it grew and like the roots are just taking over the whole thing and it's all the roots are in the shape of the pot after a while? That's us. We have no margin in our lives. We have given ourselves so wholeheartedly to things, to our little G gods in our life. We give ourselves to those things that we have absolutely no margin in which to grow. We suck up every bit of our bandwidth with, with things that won't help us grow but we think are important somehow. And so we become so imbalanced that we don't even spread out and deep. That the first thing to come along that could knock us over can knock us over because we haven't spread out and become deep. And we grow through immaturity. You know, they used to say, when I was growing up, and some of you know because you're the same age as me, when you turned 18, there was always this kind of fear in the back of your head <laughs> that mom and dad were going to kick you out because they told you, they reminded you every day of your 17th year that when you turn 18, you're an adult and you have to have a job and you have to start supporting yourself. And, have to, and if, you were, if you were lucky, you grew up in a family that had some money, right? And they could send you off to college and you can do all that. Or you just worked your way through college. And 18 was the, that was it. That's when you knew you had to start adulting, right? That's when you had to do it. That's when you had to become an adult was when you were 18. But you think 100 years before that, it was like when you hit puberty, right? 100 years before that, when you hit puberty, when you were 13, 14, 15 years old, you were starting to be considered an adult, right? And you had to start to help support yourself or support the family. And now they say delayed adolescence is all the way up until like 27, 28, 29 years old. And it's this, it's this thing we build into our kids because we overfunction for them. We don't allow them to, to, be, to stretch their wings and spread their roots and become adults on their own. We've overfunctioned to, for them to the point where they don't want to grow up. And in our faith, we have this, this refusal in our head and our heart to grow up. But that's what God wants us to do. That's what discipleship is about. It's about growing up. But as long as we refuse, we'll stun it. And then there's just immorality. And we, we've kind of, the church is over-focused on this one ad nauseum, but it's the truth. If you overindulge in whatever you want that makes you feel good, you're going to poison yourself. You're going to stunt your growth. You ever seen, I, I took up gardening because I'm from the desert. I'm from Las Vegas, right? So I took up gardening in the 90s, right? Because I never knew you could just put seeds in the ground and things would grow. I thought that was amazing, right? 
And so I took up gardening, and one of the things I found out is when it was raining, I was like, yeah, my plants are going to grow. In like you know, a really wet season, I was all pumped, and then like a storm would come and knock them all down. And I asked my friends, they said, well, you don't want it to rain all the time. You want it to rain for a little bit and then dry up. Rain, dry up. You want stress relief, stress relief, because it causes the plants to sink their roots deep. And if you don't, if you just have a really wet season, all you have is plants that spread their roots across the surface, and they're super shallow. So the first storm that comes along knocks them all out, and we're the same way. We overindulge in the things that we think we want and we like, and we just focus on those things, and we become so shallow. The thing is, is that we never stressed. We never allowed stress to grow us and sink our roots deep so that we could stand up when the storms come. And then there's just indifference. So I don't care. I don't care about growing up. It's apathy. You know, and maybe you just came to church because somebody nagged you into it, or your parents made you, or whatever. And you just came to check a box, and you know, I could care less about growing up or anything like that. But we're supposed to be growing in grace. We're supposed to be growing in love. We're supposed to be growing in our, cap- our capability, our capacity to love. And you know what the opposite of love is? It's not hate. At least when someone hates me, at least they're passionate about it, right? It's apathy. It's not caring. If you can look at the images coming out of Louisiana right now and see 30,000, 40,000 people with no homes anymore and your heart isn't breaking and it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you've got an issue. With apathy. If you can look at kids being blown up in Syria and your heart doesn't break, you've got an issue, you've got an apathetic heart and a cold heart, and you need to address that right away. I mean, when we become indifferent about growth, what are we saying to God? And then there's just ingratitude, you know, that we have the arrogance to think that everything I have, I did on my own. I earned it for myself. This is mine. I own it. I did this. And we just totally, you know, it takes amazing humility to grow. And that's what gratitude is about. It's stopping every day and saying, God, I look at all that you've done for me, all the grace that you've poured out on me, all the opportunities I've had, all the times you've saved my bacon. And I am so, so grateful. And it takes humility to grow, because if you're arrogant, you're never going to grow. Never. And then there's and this one. I, I just really, I, insecure people sometimes as a pastor, I just want to grab you and shake you and do that thing like in the old airplane movie where they grab somebody <laughs> and they slap them while they're... And it's not because I hate them. It's not. You know what? You know what I hate about insecurity is it reminds me of the worst parts of myself. It really does. And I, I see, I see, I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Trust me, ask my wife. She knows, right? I'm a work in progress, and I've been a work in progress. I got a late start, a lot later than some of you guys, right? Me too. But I know where I was, and I know how, oh, horribly insecure I was before I found God. So horribly insecure. And I know the transformation that's taken place from that point to now. I know what's happened. It's been nothing short of miraculous in my life. And it's amazing. And I, I look at that and I'm like, wow, what happened? And you know how he did it? He did it through you. He changed me through the church. He transformed me through you. It's the craziest thing. You know, when we're insecure, really what we're telling God is, I'm so screwed up that you can't fix me. There's no hope for me. Really? You're going to tell God that? Really? God can't change you. God can't transform you. It's all, it, it borders on sinful when we dwell in our insecurities. It just borders on saying to God that you're not powerful to change what I've screwed up or what the world screwed up. You know, Paul said that that we're supposed to grow. We're built for growth. We're supposed to grow more and more like Christ. And he said, when we do, what happens is we'll no longer be like infants, 
tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And you can imagine a baby, you know, like in, in, in the rough waves down at the Gulf or something being knocked over or a sapling being blown over by storms that hasn't bothered to sink its roots deep and to spread out and to become strong. You know, we're about to become grandparents. And, and that little baby girl in about a month, the one thing she's going to need to do when she gets into this world is start growing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing she needs to do in order to do that, the one thing she needs in her life is she needs examples of people who are growing in her life so she sees what is possible. She needs people whom God is changing and transforming so she can see what she could be one day. Because if she doesn't, if she's got busted up, broke up, insecure, selfish, uncaring parents and grandparents, then that's all she can see she can ever be. And where's the hope in that? Where's the potential in that? She needs us. She needs her family to surround us. She needs even more than that. She needs the church that she's going to come to. To, to surround her and show her all these examples of people that God is transforming so that she knows, she grows up one day and she knows where she can be one day. That's half our problem is we, we don't have any examples of hope in our lives. You know, that's a funny thing. Like I said, you guys changed me. There's this thought in our heads sometimes that we can do it on our own. Why do I need church? Why do I have to have these people? Why do I have to go to church? I mean, seriously, couldn't it just be me and the Bible and Jesus, right? And we can work this whole thing out. And, and, and Jesus never gives us that option. We have to have a church. Listen to what Paul says. He says, we'll grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together, and every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love, and each part does its work. And you think, why do I need the church? You need the church because that's the thing that's going to transform your life. It's what changed me because God somehow, joke on me, forced me to be in relationship with you guys when I would have rather been by myself. It's in my nature just to go off and separate myself and hide away from people and not have to deal with their icky feelings <laughs> and their opinions and their needs and their wants. I'd rather just isolate and numb myself. And God said, you'll never grow like that. Mm -hmm. And so the person I am today is because of you. And the person you'll become is because of the people around you, if you allow it to happen. We have to have the church in order to grow. If you want to thrive, you have to grow. You know, when I think of this concept, I, um, I know of a man, he often says this about the church. He says that the church is the hope of the world. And I love that, that the church really is the hope of the world. And that's large church. That means every individual church and all the churches that are around, they really, really are the hope of the world. And it seems like in so many ways, the church is one of the most disrespected organizations on the planet, you know, at, at, at this point. And yet God offered it up to us as a means for us to grow. And I think that we often take it for granted and we take for granted the impact that it makes when we come together. Something as simple as seat, sitting in your seat makes a difference to the other people who come in here. It's no fun to come in here and sit in the seat by yourself, is it? It's better to have other people know that there are needs and they're being met. And so, you know, I was thinking about the difference the church has, has made in my life. You know, I didn't grow up in the type of home Ava Grace is going to grow up in. I mean, that's how God works, right? I didn't grow up in a, in, a, in a home where Jesus was talked about except as a cuss word. I didn't have a church. I never went to church until I was 30 years old. This church is so powerful, and God gave it to us as this precious gift, and we treat it so carelessly. And the church does so many things for our lives when we come together, and it's one of the best vehicles God has given us to grow. 
And there's just some things that it provides that I just want to share with you this morning. I think the church provides encouragement. It's a tough world out there. A lot of you, you walk out the door on Sunday morning, and you go out in that world, and you get the snot beat out of you all week. And it's tough, and it's hard, and you need to come to a place where you're reminded that there's a God who loves you no matter what, that there's a God who knows the good, the bad, the ugly in you, but there's a God who sees potential. You need people to tell you that. You need the other people in the church to tell you that. And one of the biggest encouragements for me when I came into a church, and boy, was I intimidated to come into a church, was the fact that there were just times when my faith was really, really weak. There were times when my doubt was really, really strong. And the church, you know what the church did? The church would carry my faith when I wasn't strong enough to carry it myself. What a beautiful gift the church is. So we get encouragement from the church. We also get this concept of exploration. I mean, where else can you go? You can't go sit down at your boss's office on a Tuesday afternoon and say, so do you think that God really causes the evil in the world? I mean, you can't do that. That's not the environment to do that. But the church ought to be the place where you can come in and you're free to ask your questions. God's not afraid of doubt. God's not afraid of your questions. You, if you can't sit in a church and ask a question, you might be in the wrong church. It's all about exploring. You see, we live in a Google world. And anything, we think, you know, we have to know the answer to everything immediately. You know, if Michael and I are arguing about when a song was written, I can Google and find out real quick and tell him I'm right, right? I mean, that's what we do, right? Even so if we, it's not. Yeah, right, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we have, you know we, have this, we have this need to always be right and to always have the answer. Whatever happened to curiosity? It's okay to be curious. How does God work? I don't know. Let's figure it out together. See, the church is the hope of the world. Another thing that happens in church is we have this concept of exposure. You know, we're, we're just exposed a little bit. You know, we, uh, we, we take risk in church. We do things in church that make us uncomfortable. Like we might have to walk up and ask somebody to pray for a burden that's on our heart. That makes me feel uncomfortable. Or God forbid I might have to go in and teach a, room of four, uh, 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 teach a class with four-year-olds, right? I mean, that's yeah. uncomfortable. <laughs> and then we have to hear about things. We have to hear about things that happen in our community. We have to hear about these little kids that this couple in our church are going to Thailand to take them vitamins because they don't get proper nutrition. We hear all these things and we're exposed to these things and it's good for us to be exposed to this thing because it gets the focus off us and gets the focus on who our focus in this life should be on, which is God. Another one that happens to us is that, you know, we need to be in this environment. You need to be in an environment where you come in and you are reminded you are reminded that there is something much bigger than you, and there's something you can be a bigger part of. And there is something that you need to be taken into every nook and cranny of your life that you go to, this environment. You know, plants don't grow. Trees don't grow if they're not in the right soil, do they? I mean, they don't grow. They can't grow. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's the same thing with us. We've got to be in the environment. The church is the hope of the world. And then where else can you go and spend a little time in examination? You know, we're so busy living our lives, doing our thing, running 90 to nothing, 24-7. We don't ever even just get a moment just to sit. The closest thing we get to it is in church. And if you're sitting and listening and the message is going on and the, or the songs are going on and your brain wonders and you're thinking about your life and you're examining yourself, who's to say that's not of God just as much, right? I mean, we examine ourselves. We have to do some of that interpersonal work. It's something that we work on our entire lives. We work on that, examining ourselves, figuring out where we are. You know, what are, what are our next steps? And then finally, you know, I think that we grow in community. The church truly is the hope of the world by our experiences. You know, when we come together, there's going to be somebody in here is going to have an event happen to them. No doubt about it. Probably by the end of the year, somebody's going to have a major life event to them. And through that experience, you know, we'll be praying for those people and that prayer list comes out and y'all are so faithful to pray over the needs of those people. Or on our Facebook group page where I saw somebody just post a, a prayer request this week and so many of y'all were on there, we're praying for you, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. You know, we're going to be tested in our faith. And isn't it great to know that when you're tested, you're not standing there alone? You're not standing there alone. There are other people standing with you and we'll grow as a result of that. Our church will be tested. There'll be a situation where we can't do this or we can't do that or we'll have a flood or who knows what's next, right? We'll be tested, but we grow in that experience. And then ultimately we grow when we just surrender and we just say, you know what, God? It's not all about us. It's always been all about you. And if we can surrender, if we can surrender our lives, if we can surrender our church to that, it'll be amazing to see what God does in our midst. Because if you want a life that thrives, You've got to allow yourself to grow. 
And God, in his infinite wisdom, gave you the gift of the church so that you could grow. That's crazy, isn't it? But here's the thing. In order for all of us to grow, each and every one of you have to be willing to jump in and engage. Each and every one of you has a part to play. You know, a leaf can't look at the rest of the tree and say, you know what, I'm just happy being a leaf. I'm going to detach and go do my own thing. No, the tree needs the leaf to bring energy into the tree, right? Just like that's our symbol for this church is a leaf, you know? Every last one of us brings energy into this tree that God has planted here. Every last one of us. We need the trunks. We need the limbs. We need the stems. We need the tree. We need the roots. We need all of it in order to grow. Every last one of us has a part to play. Even, you know, like as pastors, you know, we get like leader crushes on like, you know, really famous pastors and stuff. We're like, man, I want to be like that person one day. I'd love for this church to be like that. And they have a lot more problems. They, their problems just have zeros on them, you know. Yeah, yeah. They have a lot more problems. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. When, when you go and listen to those people and, and you really hear what they're saying to you, it's, it's that, you know, I... I did my job. I did the best I knew how to do. But the thing that really caused the growth is when I stepped aside and allowed God to grow people. Mm -hmm. I just did my part. I did what I was supposed to do. I encouraged other people to do what they were supposed to do, to jump in and have their part. But when I stepped aside and allowed God to take over the church, his church, and do his thing, it grew. And it grew like crazy. Even, even Paul, in, in his, his letter here to the Corinthians, he said, I planted the seed in your hearts. It's great. You know, and, I, and another pastor came along and they watered it, but it was God who made it grow. We have to be in this environment to grow. We have to be a part of a church and we have to engage, not just for ourselves, but for the whole body. And when we do, we'll thrive. If I get the band to come forward. So we have to know... We have to grow. We have to go. I want you to know that God wants so much more for you than just to live a life where you're just trying to survive. God wants you to live a life where you thrive. If you'll turn to your next steps on the back of your info card, it has a few things for you to think about this morning as our band comes to do our closing songs. It says, when it comes to my faith, the thing I do best to grow is. What's the thing you do best to grow? Ask yourself, you know, what, what's the thing I do bet? Maybe it's you come to church. Maybe it's you spend some time in quiet. Maybe it's you go out and try to do nice things for you. What is, the, what is the thing you do best to grow? And then the second question is, when it comes to my faith, my growing edge is. What, are the thing, what is the thing you know you need to do so you can grow? I'm sure the Lord spoke to you as you were listening to the words this morning. You know, what, what is God telling you that you need to do so you can grow into the disciple and follower he wants you to grow into? And then we have the, the option, and we hope you'll take it up. In order to grow, I'm going to join a grow group. Yeah, we grow together. So we get in a group together, and we learn together. This fall, we're doing a, a whole group emphasis. We'll be teaching a message series along with it, and you'll be studying it in your small group. So I hope you'll sign up for a grow group. They're offered on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesdays, we have child care, and uh, we have Wednesday night groups, so you can sign up for that. And then maybe you walked in here this morning, and you know you need to grow. But the place you need to start is with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're like me and, you know, for the first time you walked into a church, maybe, you know, it's the first morning you've walked in. And I didn't walk in until I was 30 years old. And when I walked in, boy, did I start growing then. And the beauty of it is I've grown every day since, and God's still not done. As I said before, we just all need a big, giant orange sticker that says under construction, right? God's working on us. He's growing us. But if you'd like to take that first step and to put your faith in Jesus Christ, you just mark that on your card. We won't do a thing in the world to embarrass you. We will call you and help you take your next steps so that you can grow. And then maybe you've been thinking about being baptized. We have a baptism come up in a couple weeks. You can sign up for that as well. If you would, please stand as our band leads us in our closing song today.